No, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to episode 26. This week we are without Michael, so we brought in a special guest, um, my wonderful wife, Haley. Probably better. She, <laughs> she's so excited, honestly, to, to be here that she dressed the same colors as the room. Yes, this was on purpose. 100%. <laughs> so yeah, we're excited to have her today and her contribution to um, Romans. We're looking at chapters 8 through... <laughs> Maybe 11. We'll see what happens. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I think that you could preach an infinite number of sermons out of chapter 8. Yes, there there mm-hmm. seems to be no end to it. It's, uh, you just keep scratching. Well, and that's the reality is when you start studying uh, and even get back to the original languages that every word almost turns into a sermon. <laughs> I know. And so it's uh, it's excessive. And so who was the, the pastor that went so long in Romans? John Piper. John Piper. And it was how long? I just know that people will measure how long they've been at his church based on where he was in Romans when they got there. <laughs> we were here from chapter two to chapter four. <laughs> it was 25 years. It's <laughs> a long time. Yeah. It's, uh, so I get it, you know, because you know, I first heard that story. It was years. He spent years in it. And it's like, you know, I, that seems excessive. And then as you start studying this, it's like, you know... If you really wanted to park the bus, you could. I could see where you could make sermons out of almost every, well, for sure, every paragraph could be a full a full thought and a full sermon. And so we see right. that uh, as it kicks off in Romans 1, the first the first verse is like, okay, well, we could park the bus there and, yeah. and just have a little celebration for a whole week. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always say that chapter 8 of Romans is one of the most encouraging chapters that you find all in Scripture. It's got... One, there's no condemnation. The Spirit's role in your life. And then it ends with that there's nothing that can separate us from God. Yeah. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on things of the flesh. But those who have their mind set on the Spirit or live according to the Spirit have their, you know, mind set on things of the Spirit. So the Spirit within us allows us to put to death the flesh. So you're saying that before the Spirit, we only had one option. Right. There was mm-hmm. no spiritual focus option. Yeah, I think Paul flesh. even kind of mentions that before. Yep. Without the Spirit, your life is on target. There's, there's, you don't deserve any life. There's, you're on target for death. Um, and so, um, without the Spirit, you, your outlook on life, set on things of the flesh. Yeah, the outlook on life is hostile to God. Yeah. So anyway, with the Spirit, you're able to put to death the flesh, and that looks different probably in everybody, but <laughs> you probably notice in your spiritual life that there are things that you have to actively try to stay away from. Yes. And um, that is the spirit working inside of you, letting you know, like, those things are bad. Because if you didn't have the spirit inside of you, what moral law do you have? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So well, it comes back to um, as far as the working out of this thing is intentionality mm-hmm. is a word we use a lot. As we talk about, you know, parenting, you got to be intentional, right? It's not just going right. to osmotic parenting doesn't work. It's, uh, you know, from our perspective, our kids are a little older now, so we have to be intentional. We made Sierra come down out of her room, what was it, not last night, she worked late last night, the night before. You know, she has a tendency to go up there and kind of hole up, right? It's like, no, come down, hang out with us. We just want to spend time with mm-hmm. you. And uh, and so, you know, if, if you want to have that relationship, you have to be intentional. I think the same thing with the flesh, if we're going to put it to death or focus on the spirit it's not just going to happen accidentally it's going to have to it's going to require some intentionality you know if you you want to lose weight you have to be intentional you want to you know work out go to the gym go has to be intentional it's uh all the stuff that is good for us requires a level of intentionality on a consistent basis it's never a one and done Mm -hmm. and so it uh when i read this i that comes kind of back to my mind if I want to focus on the things of the spirit, then, you know, when I get up in the morning, don't grab the phone and turn on Facebook or Instagram. You know, that's, that's the wrong direction, right? It, um, save some of that early time and that, uh, for, for things that are good, spiritually good, spiritually beneficial. Yeah. We were talking to someone, um, the other day about, you know, the, where goodness comes from. Like, is there really no goodness at all? in our flesh. 
um, I think we kind of came to the conclusion of, yes, like you can do good things, but you go back to what you said, where's the intention with that? Yeah. Um, you know, if it's not rooted in the spirit, then it's rooted in the flesh and means that all of our goodness would end up being selfishness. It is right. Because even the good apart from God is just us trying to feel good. Right. Yeah. yeah we want to feel good about ourselves or want other people to think good about us. Mm-hmm. Way of the okay. master, you a good person? Yeah. Yes, I've, I've done great things. Right. See you in heaven. You're right. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, of the body, you will live. And so by putting to death the flesh through the Spirit, that gives us eternal life. Verse 15 and 16 kind of go together there because it's when we cry out in the oh, Spirit, yeah. Abba, Father, then God responds from the Spirit, my child. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. there is there is that uh, a back and forth that's kind of seen there in those two verses. That when we are his children, and there's going to be some sense of that. And people say, well, can you really know? I'm like, yeah, I feel pretty confident about this thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I really do know. It's uh, and, and it's just hard to take people from not knowing to the reality that you can know apart from them knowing. Mm-hmm. It's just and some things are only discovered experientially. Uh, at least to the fullest level. I can tell you about it, that, uh, or I can just tell you that I'm confident, but, you know, you, you can't really trust that, right? <laughs> yeah, if you, yeah, if you haven't experienced it, then yeah. I guess what you say, it matters to your life, right. but for yeah. mine, not so much. it does nothing. All right. And uh, so the scripture says that we can know. And so let's take it away from experience right now. So right. I'm not telling you what I've experienced. I'm telling you what the Word of God says, that spirit bears witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God. And so God is saying that when you have his spirit, there will be some degree of witness inside of you internally that will help you know this. And uh, so, again, this yeah. is not just my experience. I'm telling you, this is what God says. And so if you've not experienced that, if you don't feel that and we hate to reduce anything to feelings in our culture, right? You say the word yeah. feel, and it's like, oh, well, I feel all sorts of stuff. Well, now, as if there's not some um, witness in the in your spirit, then there should be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that you believe in your heart that he's raised you from the dead, and you don't feel like you're you know, part of the family or whatever, then you can read this verse and know that there is something within you that bears witness that um, you are a son of the father and not, you know, and if you're children, then you're heirs. And so that's what we have to hope for. Uh, Verse 17. Yeah, there's hope too. So we can be secure in our, um, in our standing with God. And then we can also hope for what's next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So three things that will rob us of our assurance. And this is really what we're talking about when we're talking Mm -hmm. about the spirit bearing witness with our spirit is that assurance that we are the children of God. And there's three things. And, uh, number one is being lost. If if you're not a child of yeah. God, then you're <laughs> not gonna, you're not going to experience that assurance that you are. Um, number two is ignorance, and that can wreak havoc if we don't understand what God's word teaches. And so we come back to the Romans chapter eight and uh, and and First John. These things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. There's mm-hmm. there's a reality throughout God's word that we should know this. It's uh, and when you see Paul writing, there is zero doubt in his mind that his salvation is secure. Mm-hmm. And so that's the assurance we're talking about. And then the third thing that, that robs us most of the time of our assurance is sin. Mm-hmm. And so if we have ongoing sin that's unconfessed that we're just uh, refusing to deal with, then there is, there's going to be a separation that we're going to feel uh, in that. And, uh, and so it's going to make us doubt. Mm-hmm. And uh, so if uh, perhaps you're, you're hearing this today and you're thinking, well, I don't know if I have... That witness, bearing witness, then, you know, these are the three reasons that sometimes we don't have that assurance. And so and I think that's where it you know becomes dangerous to rely on those feelings because yeah. you're distracted by everything and especially sin. Um, you know, sin is going to separate us from God. Um, so to go back and read the truth um, and know that that's what saves us. It's not, you know, how we feel that day or. You know, I don't think I, I feel God speaking to me. So, you know, maybe I'm just not even saved anymore. Who knows? Yeah, right. But going back to this and um, 
knowing how the spirit works in our lives and, um, you know, the fruits that we'll have in our life because of what God did for us. Then he gets into the suffering. Yeah. What do you think it means that creation eagerly awaits for the revelation of the son of God? Why, why did Paul bring creation into this? I think from the first sin, creation was put under a curse, and so it is groaning ready for the redemption as well. Yeah. Yeah, it says in verse 21, the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. And we also groan inwardly because we have the spiritual battle within us. We're yes. constantly fighting the spirit who wants us to do the will of God, which is conformity to to Christ. And we, in our flesh, have this want to do sin, and that's all, like, we're just constantly fighting. And so that's exhausting. Yes. I speak from experience. <laughs> <laughs> I lie not. Yeah. <laughs> we're well, already in chapter nine now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we eagerly await for our bodies, you know, to be redeemed. And so that we no longer have to deal and fight constantly with mm -hmm. ourselves. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I love going into the hope 24 and 25 for in hope. We were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with endurance. And that's just, that's a beautiful picture of, you know, we do have so much suffering, whether it you can see it from the outside or we have that internal suffering like Josh was talking about. And um, But through all that suffering, um, we hope for for eternity, ultimately. Yeah, and, and true hope does affect us. It changes our our thought pattern. It changes our emotions, our, our expectations. I did a, a funeral yesterday, and, uh, you know, their, their loved one, 85 years old, you know, which is, is beautiful. I love, I love doing funerals for people that die in Christ, number one, and have lived a long life, had 47 grandchildren. Mm. It's like, you know, so this is, for, for me, it's like, okay, this is a celebration, right? She has graduated, and, uh, and we're celebrating her, her home going. But uh, I understand it also from the perspective of those sitting in the seat that, you know, they lost their mother, and um, they lost their grandmother. And, and life's going to move on in that absence of a life that you had grown to love, and so there's heartbreak in that. But there's also hope because of this passage and passages like it. Hey, look, we, we can't see it yet. We, we believe based on God's word that these things are true. And so we place our hope in that. And that's really what salvation is, placing your full hope in him, mm -hmm. that his word is true. And to the point that it, that it affects us, you know, how we feel and how we think and how we behave. And so we don't, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. Right. Right. And even in our weaknesses, verse 26, we have the spirit. Again, remi Paul's reminding us that we have the spirit within us who will intercede for us um, with inexpressible groanings is what this says. And he searches our hearts and knows, you know, what we feel and can intercede to the father for us when we don't have the words to say. I think at this time when Paul has written this letter, the emperor has already kicked out. Claudius has yeah. already kicked out all the Jews. Right. So, you know, if there's any Jewish brothers that are still around, they're probably a little bit fearful of their life. And, you know, ultimately we know that Nero is going to blame, you know, the fire on Rome, you know, on the Christians. And so they're going to go under extreme persecution. Yeah. So this kind of passage here is going to help them through this. This is going to give them some hope. And now we're getting closer to some, some more tedious information. <laughs> that, uh, some of you have been on the edge of your seat. I'll say some of you, about two of you. <laughs> It, uh, waiting for us to get to these portions, particularly in Romans, because there's like quite a few women in Romans, mm. that get to the idea of foreknowledge and predestination and election. They're uh, trigger words. Trigger words. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm triggered this morning. Well, and she's right. They are trigger words uh, theologically because people have been debating this hostily, unfortunately, for uh, centuries. This is not like something we're going to solve today for everybody's satisfaction. Where you're like, here's the reality, and y'all been missing it for the last 400 years. And all these smart people didn't weren't smart as us. Right. I don't believe that. I believe that there is a tension in the Word of God when it comes to this subject matter because God's ways are not our ways, and His thoughts are not our thoughts, and He's higher than that. And so we are. Paul has given us some surface reference to things that go beyond. The, the finiteness of our understanding. And uh, it's not 
it's not a bad idea to discuss it, to talk about it, as long as I think people do so peaceably. Here's I'm gonna go ahead and pull back the covers. Okay. All right, all right. <laughs> Here, here's where the problem is. The problem is somebody thinks they figured this thing out and they become arrogant in their approach to it and toward other people. And so anybody that doesn't agree with them now is less than or stupid or you know less theological or doesn't really believe God. A guy said in the video on in Facebook. Uh, I think I saw it yesterday, honestly. That That's hilarious. If a church is not reformed, it's not pleasing to God. And I'm like, well, I mean, first of all, let's talk about what reformed is in your, your mindset. Right. right? When you say <laughs> that, what do you mean? Because I'm not sure we would agree there. But beyond that, um, I don't know that I want to be labeled. Mm-hmm. Quite yeah, honestly, right. I don't, I don't want to be By a Calvinist other than the or Bible. an Arminian. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be a Biblicist. <laughs> And it, uh, I think both sides of the aisle tend to be a little aggressive mm-hmm. uh, in their approach to what they think is truth. And, uh, you know, the the problem we have that we keep coming back to is that the word of God is true. And in this particular matter, from our finiteness, it's not consistent mm-hmm. um, because whosoever will may come. It's either true or it ain't. And yet... Nobody can come unless they're called. It's either true or it ain't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so I was like, well, wait a minute. How can both be true? Well, that's a great question. Well, and, and I think uh, that's where the, the danger comes in focusing so much on this section of Romans that it almost becomes your gospel. You're basing your whole beliefs on just this small, small passage when really you need to take everything into consideration. Yeah. Well, and you're right. There's only very little information in regards to these subjects because this was what this was not what our our deepest issue is mm-hmm. <laughs> right, right. It is a part of our it is, it is part of what we need to understand this. so let's read it i'm gonna read it and then yeah. we'll talk about it um verse 29 because whom he foreknew oh my god he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters and and those he predestined he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. Yeah, so there's a like a, a path. Yes. It's, mm-hmm. you know, the foreknowledge of God yep. leads to the predestination of, of those he called, Yep. and those he called, he justified, and then he ultimately glorifies. Glorifies, yeah. And we need an arrow chart. I know, we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and it's very linear, so it's not hard yeah. to track. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. He foreknew you, and so let's talk about that. God knows everything, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so there's nothing that God did not foreknow. Yeah. <laughs> why, would exactly. he, why would he call someone who he knew was not going to follow him? Right. And so there's zero information that has ever surprised God. He's known everything from the beginning. And so everybody that's going to be in heaven, he knew before he created the earth. Right. So that's uh, if that if that messes you up theologically, then stop. <laughs> stop being messed up because this is truth. Because God is omniscient; He knows everything. Yep. And so we start with that. And so if He knows everybody that's going to be saved, then you know the rest of this really falls in pretty easily after that. Yeah, mm-hmm. because then He has you know predestined; He's determined your destination. Yeah. Um, to be conformed to the image of his son. And that's what it says. It's not just you're predestined. You are predestined to be conformed right. to Jesus Christ. Um, and and so if you, Paul's pointing to the end result here. Right. Yep. yep. Um, ultimately, yeah, that and, and glorification go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. So we got predestined to the image of his son. And then, and those he predestined, he also called. So that calling is called into, into salvation, essentially. And then when you have been called into salvation, then he's justified you, which means that you have been declared righteous in that moment. And then when you have been justified, future tense, <laughs> you will be glorified. Right. Because mm-hmm. right now we're not glorified. Yep. We still yeah. live in those yeah. wretched yeah. bodies. Yeah, that's right. We will <laughs> have a glorified body. <laughs> yeah. Still requires exercise. It requires <laughs> dieting. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah, mm-hmm. I know. <laughs> and so that, yeah, that's the line. That's wretched that's, man that's I the, am. That's the timeline that he's kind of explaining there. Well, and I don't find it so difficult. I don't either. Okay. All right. So, you know, much yeah. much to do about nothing. <laughs> much to <laughs> do about something. Moving here, on. Here's the, the deeper subject matter that I think if we're going to glean from this, we should glean confidence. Right. Um, and, and not, you know, that we have 
a theology that's shaky, but the reality is we have a salvation that's not. Right. Um, because it's really not built on us. God did this, and he did it to us. And, uh, yeah, there's going to be some moments in Scripture that are going to kind of put a light on our response to that, but the the very first initiation of salvation is God. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. He, he's the one that did all of this. Slam, a lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, Scripture says. And so before the world began, this whole plan was in place, and God foreknew everything and everyone that would be in heaven. You can't run from that information. No. And so it's... Uh, it's always going to be there, and and so there, it is impactful theologically. Now, since we're here. Yeah. <laughs> since we're here. Since we're here. Uh, because here's uh, the natural conclusion of that theology taken to its natural limits. If God knows everything, everybody that's going to be saved, he's already called them, he's going to justify them, he's going to glorify them, then what's the point? He also says to do more than that. Yeah. So obedience is obviously one of the answers to that particular um, issue. But uh, there's more to it than that even, I would think. uh, Yeah, God does know everything. But if the idea is, I mean, why even have Scripture? Right. So Mm -hmm. I think if you look in in chapter 9, and I know that we got it, we're probably going to back up some, but... Paul even addresses the question, yeah. why yeah. does he still find fault? Right. For who yeah. has ever resisted his will? Yeah. Um, but his response to that is, shut it, up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you think you are questioning God. Right. <laughs> it's like, that's not really an answer, Paul. I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, <clears throat> sit down and shut your mouth. <laughs> that that kind of, yeah, that goes into something else where he's kind of talking about how he's grafted in the Gentiles. And, right, it does, yeah. So, Who are you to say? But it's the same yeah, idea. It is, yeah. yeah. Or, um, or Esau have a loved and, and, and Jacob. Yeah. Jacob have a loved, Esau have a hated. Yep. And again, it's the same idea. Well, if God's going to, you know, pick favorites, and we could go to that degree if we wanted to be, and, uh, then how how does he then find fault if he didn't choose that one? And and Paul basically says that's outside the yeah. realm of your need to know basis. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> you don't well, have, you don't have a need our, to know for that. Our understanding, like, we can't understand. We have no foreknowledge of anything really, except yeah. that Jesus is going to come back, and you know what well, he says in here. Well, and here's what it assaults: it assaults our understanding that God is ultimately good, right? So when we think, well, God created people that He knew we're going to spend eternity in hell, then is God good? And so there's where the deep mm-hmm. processes start happening yeah. for <clears throat> from a theological perspective. It, uh, well, and that's, I think, where the balance of understanding God's foreknowledge and his sovereignty over every detail of life and our free will. Yeah. Because in our sinful nature, our free will wants us to do bad things. And we're destined for hell because of that. And if we are to live in obedience, we have to have some kind of will within ourselves to even be able to want to live in obedience. I think we, for, uh, we forget our place. Yeah. Because when we say, is God good? We think of it from the perspective of us. Yeah. Right. But God is good from the perspective of God. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> And so, he is just in every decision yeah, that he makes. that's right. He will show mercy on whom he's going to show mercy and compassion on whom he's going to show compassion. That's it. So yeah. people go to heaven and it brings him glory because it elevates his compassion and his grace. Mm -hmm. And this is harsh, but if people go to hell, it also, he gets glory from that. Right. Because it it demonstrates his justice. And uh, I think we just hit chapter nine. I think so. (laughs) Well, and if if everyone's going to go to heaven, then what's the point of any of it? That's true. And vice versa. Yeah. Or or if nobody has an option, what's the point of any of it? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so I just messed with you. And we're just, <laughs> just back in the same place. Uh, oh, this yeah, is... Paul says in 922, if God is willing to demonstrate his wrath, what if God is willing yeah. to demonstrate his wrath to make known his power um, mm-hmm. has endured with much patience the objects of wrath prepared for destruction? So essentially he's saying that, you know, what if there are some that don't make it because we need to be able to see God's wrath and power so that his grace is that much more, more magnified magnified yep right well and i think from you know a human perspective we like you know things to be fair and everyone mm. to have an equal chance mm. and yeah. all that but 
God is God. I mean, that's Romans not Bible. One, <laughs> right, I mean, Romans one made it very clear that there was a chance. Yeah, we yeah. we want it to be fair, but we don't understand if it were fair, we'd all go to hell. Right. And mm-hmm. so we mm-hmm. don't want it to be fair. Ultimately, well, mm-hmm. we we want it to be unfair, <laughs> very much unfair. But you know, our sense of fairness is assaulted whenever we realize that it's it's grace for some and it's fairness for others, and it's uh, and that's a harsh truth. And, you know, at some point we just got to sit and wrestle with it and come to the conclusion that Paul says, look, you were the created thing. Who are you to, right. to question the creator? Yeah. That um, ultimately God is God. And, and whether you like it or don't like it doesn't change whether it's true. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we got to come back to, well, here's the good news. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I read well, it through these chapters and, you know, it, you feel like, they're powerful. Yes. They're great. I love these. But there's also that feeling in your flesh like, oh, I know people who are not saved. Yeah. And it, it hurts yes. to know that there are people that you love that are not going to make it. So I think that's where the a lot of the wrestling and the uncomfortableness come in this in these chapters. Yeah. Well, the good news also is is that if we don't have to play some kind of role in our salvation, you know, in, in terms of God's grace, then that means that there's nothing on our end that takes it away. That's right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's what he gets into at the end of chapter 8. That there's nothing that separates us from the love of God. Once we are in him, we are in him forever. And he lists the entire world at the bottom. You know, there's <laughs> <laughs> we have complete victory. Um, there's neither death, life, angels, heavenly rulers, things that are present, things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation. Because he you know, couldn't list everything, but he just covers mm-hmm. it all right there. That can remove us or that can separate us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, Which, uh, and I think that that particular thought is necessary before we get into chapter 9. Mm-hmm. Because it tells us, here's what, God, here's what Paul knows about his salvation. Yeah. He is completely chosen by God, redeemed by God, set apart by God, and it is with it is untouchable. Nothing can separate him from that. Mm-hmm. Now, he goes into the hypothetical <laughs> in chapter yeah. 9. Israel, and I mean, we saw this through Acts. Every time Paul would go to preach in a synagogue somewhere, some Jews would believe and some would, re- would reject, and, and they eventually kick him out of town and have to run him off. And it was dangerous. They, I mean, they got really upset about this teaching. And Paul, even though this happened, he still wishes that he, if, if there was some way that he could, you know, be cursed by Christ and be cut off, that his brothers would be able to hear and understand and accept this um, truth. That blows my mind. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, but let's, let's keep this in context. It is a very safe hypoth- hypothetical for Paul. It's because he knows it's not possible. Right. It's it like, is, yeah, it's very know, safe. I'd, I'd <laughs> swim to see, you. I'd send across the Atlantic Ocean for you if I could, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I can't. I barely can't make it across the bathtub, yeah. so I think we're good. I just thought it was funny that he wrote it down. <laughs> yeah, it, it is, and it does. I think he's trying. Uh, he's to trying to yeah be extreme. Extreme, so he can show that uh, the reality of his own heart toward his people, because you know it's already been one of his criticisms that basically he don't like Jewish people and he don't like the law. And, sure, you know he's. Yeah. Anti-Semite, even though he himself is. <laughs> but yeah, in <laughs> reality, Jewish. Israel was chosen from the beginning. I yeah. mean, all mm-hmm. this talk about foreknowledge and predestination and being called, they were the first. Yeah. So if anybody should have this salvation, it should be the Jews. Yeah. But essentially, they rejected it. And yeah. so he goes into this whole thing about how, you know, just because you're an Israelite doesn't mean that you were a chosen Israelite. Yeah. And well, and so this gets is into a mess <laughs> where the whole Jacob and Esau thing comes in. Right. We kind of clear focus that. too, simply because Esau was the natural, right? He was he firstborn, was firstborn, and, the older. And so for him to have been the one of blessing is out of order. And so Paul is using this intentionally to show, Hey, look, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and I think the question comes up, how could God, you know, hate someone like that? And I don't think it's hate because Esau was still blessed. He had wealth. Yes. He had everything that yeah. he probably could have wanted minus just the the carrying of um, the inheritance, so to right. speak. Mm-hmm. Right. But compared to what Jacob was blessed with, 
it looks like hate. <laughs> right. Well, so Jacob was the recipient of the continuation of promise. Right. But, uh, you know, I would be surprised if Esau's not in heaven. Oh, yeah. And so, you know. I mean, it's a win-win. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty he did, loving hate he, right he there. He did all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, this passage of chapter 15 is kind of the the linchpin of our theological lives. God will do what God does. He'll mm-hmm. have mercy when he has mercy, compassion when he has compassion. And uh, rather than us finding fault with God, what we find is compassion in God. We find mercy in God. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the only other option is everybody goes to hell. Right. Now the Gentiles have been able to be grafted in, yeah. and you know, like he says, I think it's is it Hosea where he says, "I will call those who were not my people my people, mm-hmm. and those who were not or those who were unloved my beloved." Mm-hmm. And I feel like there's so much security in all of that because nothing is going to change. You know, once you're once you're saved, you're saved, and if God has called you, then you're called. Yeah, calling God is without repentance. Yeah. I believe that gets us almost over to chapter 10. I'm ready for mm-hmm. chapter 10. Let's hit it. Well, so, it's, uh, his his argument's a little bit unique. I don't know what their ideas were back then, but you know, this, who will ascend to heaven or who will descend into the abyss? I was like, well, that's... Yeah. Obviously, he's pointing out a works-based right. ideology, mm-hmm. but uh, those are some uh, thoughts that aren't necessarily relevant for us anymore <laughs> as far as, well, I think anybody's really trying to do that, but... We're trying it in other ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I kind of see it as Paul's saying, like, there's no way for you to go into heaven and pull Christ down to earth. And there's no way for you to go into, into the abyss and pull him up from the dead. So the only way is what you have read in in Scripture. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. And he explains that is um, the word of faith that we preach. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's so it. there's nothing that you have to do other than believe or say it with your mouth and believe it in your heart. Yeah. yeah. And there's nothing like, you can do. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's just further proof of there's nothing we can do. So essentially, how do you get to that point? How do you even know about Christ? And Paul lays it out here that um, it's by someone preaching it to them. Yes. And so he mm-hmm. says, blessed are those who uh, have been sent by the Lord, basically. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That's what I was thinking of. But this version says, how timely is the arrival of those? <laughs> the Seems kind of different. Totally messed it up. I man. know. <laughs> like, man, I was I was really excited about those who preach the gospel. Um, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, because they've been sent by God. That's how you hear. So why, why even evangelize? This is why you evangelize, because Paul says so. And God says that in the CSB version. Yeah. How beautiful are those who are sent to preach? Yeah. How can, how can they respond if they've not heard? How can they hear if we don't preach? How can we preach if we're not sent? Mm-hmm. So all again, we, we see the order of things just like the foreknown, mm-hmm. predestined, called, and there's the order to, to God's way of doing things. And his you know determined order is that the preaching of the gospel results in salvation. It's not osmotic. It's just right. there's not, you can't just sit in your house and, you know, with the lights out and think something's going to come in and get you. <laughs> Faith yeah. comes from what is heard, it says yes. in verse 17. Well, and why would God call people and not use them? Like, you're you're called, you're good, just stay there. Yeah, well, First <laughs> Corinthians tells us we have this treasure in earthen vessels or char- jars of clay, some mm-hmm. versions say. And the reality is that God has ordained it to be carried by us mm-hmm. to the world. And so that's, I mean, that's basically the, the whole message of Acts is, hey, here's the story of God's people doing what God commanded them to do and the resulting activity from that. And so when they when they were obedient, the word flourished and people were saved and societies were changed. And when they were disobedient, it didn't. Right. And so how much authority do we have in all that? Well, I don't know. We and it's beyond our pay grade. The reality yeah. <laughs> is God said go, and when we're obedient, then there's power behind that. And when we're disobedient, then, you know, there's a diminishing law of return there. Well, yeah. But he still works it all 
together for good. Yeah, well, don't confuse me. <laughs> <laughs> One theological thought at a time, Haley. <laughs> don't confuse you gotta throw me. it all in there. Yeah. So you're saying, so you're saying, if I don't go, people still go get saved. Look. He won't use you, but he'll use someone else. That's right. Yeah. That God exactly does what right. he does. So, and, and that is an absolute true thought. And so here's the reality. If I don't go, then somebody else gets that blessing. Somebody else yeah. gets that reward eternally mm-hmm. instead of me. And so I'm sacrificing some of my eternal reward mm-hmm. uh, through disobedience. Right. Yeah, because God can make the rocks cry out if he wanted to. Mm-hmm. Right. He's chosen yeah. to use the, the jars of clay, the earthen vessels, us. Is dirt sacks. Yeah. <laughs> we call a body. <laughs> I was, I, I don't know if it was a video on Facebook or <clears throat> maybe an Instagram reel. Anyway, it was a pastor preaching on the word of obedience in the Old Testament. It wasn't really translated as obedience. It was, it was mostly translated as heard. And it was understood that when you heard something, you were to do it. You, When you hear it, you do it. It's not like you just hear it and take it in. So I thought that was kind of interesting yeah. that Paul is using, you know, faith comes from what is heard. And the only way that you hear something is if someone has done something too. So mm. so he brings it back to the nation of Israel. Has God rejected his people? Because obviously he's accepted the Gentiles. Right. I says, no, that's not no. what's happening. Because I too absolutely am, not. I too am a Israelite. And so he's pointing out the fact that, that God has elect, if you want to use that word. Sure. In Israel, uh, and it's been like that all the while. And uses the example of Elijah when he was uh, the only one left standing, and God says, "No, there's like seven thousand more people. Calm down." Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's a, it was like that. It really was like that. Was like, <laughs> get your thumb out of your mouth. You'll be all right. <laughs> yeah. And at the same time, there is a remnant of of those chosen by grace. He says yeah. In, yeah. in verse five. And it is by grace he makes sure that make sure that we mm. make sure we understand that it is by grace, not by works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Right. And so the elect, again, I know that's a trigger word for a lot of people, but (laughs) those whom God has foreknown are going to be saved. And the rest, he says, were hardened so that they wouldn't hear and they wouldn't receive. Yeah. And then he he basically wraps that whole section up with, you know, now I'm talking to you Gentiles. That doesn't mean that you have room for boasting. Mm -hmm. Essentially, there's... You're not better than them because you have been grafted in and they were the root. Like they were the original tree and you've just been grafted in. So if you are grafted in and they, you know, eventually hear and understand how much easier it is it for the a branch from the original tree to be grafted in. Yeah. That's what he's saying. Something wrong in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think it's a theological error to think that Israel had to reject Christ for the Gentiles to be grafted in. Um, I don't. Sure. I don't see that. I mean, I think that's the result of what had happened. But Paul kind of makes the argument: if their rejection resulted in salvation to the world, how much more would their acceptance have resulted in? Exactly. Right. It would have been. I mean, I don't know what the answer to that question is, but he's implying that it would have even been better. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it would have been better because Israel would be saved. Yeah, well, and like I said earlier, they were chosen first. Their re- rejection or their hardening is temporary. Paul writes right. mm-hmm. that it's uh, verse twenty-five. This partial hardening has happened to Israel until the number of Gentiles has come in. And so there's a time coming, and we, you know, when we get to Revelation. We'll probably hit this again, and we'll go back to Daniel sure. a little bit. But there's a time coming where that last one's going to get saved, and it's going to, I mean, at that point, time yep. is going to do something unique. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's it now. <clears throat> we move into section C. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, I mean, we eagerly await for the fullness of Gentiles to come in so that we can, um, you know, move forward with this whole plan. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, so uh, let's not skip over 29. And, okay. And Haley was hitting on this earlier. The okay. gifts and the call of God oh, are yeah. irrevocable. And again, it goes back just to the idea that God foreknew, God called, and nobody's changing that. This is it's going to come to pass. It's going to happen, and um, and we keep using the word Costco saved or Uber saved, and it's just <laughs> who's we? Yeah, uh, the smart ones. It's, <laughs> <laughs> the reality is, is that we are so 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 secure because it's all God and basically none us, and um, and so. We are secured by the power of God, and, and he just he tells us that so many times through 
these 11 chapters that, man, you are just completely, utterly, irrevocably saved for all of eternity. And here's reasons yeah. why. And he goes into how God does things. He goes into what Israel happened. So all these various pieces, I love the fact that, that Paul goes into the weeds and all that. Yeah. But the end result coming out of that has to be the conclusion that, hey, God's got me. Right. Yeah. And we've got it. The last verse there, 36, for uh, from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. Yeah. I love how he ends this with verse 33. Oh, the depths and riches of wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unfathomable his ways. And he quotes, um, what is this, Isaiah? Yeah. For who has known the mind of the Lord, who has been his counselor? Or who has first given to God that God needs to repay him? We've we've t- touched a lot of you know deep theological things that may be hard for us to understand how all these things work together, yeah. but that should drive us more to praise, like yeah. Paul is saying mm-hmm. here. Um, yeah. Oh, the depths and riches and wisdom and the knowledge of God. Well, and I love the fact that he tells us, "You're not going to understand this." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's unfathomable. Yeah. <laughs> it's Who un- has known the mind of the Lord? Right. Yeah. This is, there's a depth of this that's going to forever plague our finite minds in regards to like, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, that's right. Paul says, that's right. You don't get it. Yeah. 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 So. I mean, if we understood everything, then eventually we'd be done, right? We'd be done learning and yeah. done. <laughs> I don't need this. <laughs> yeah. but, but even though you don't understand it, the, the, again, the takeaway for us is, but God's got you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. If you are in Christ and then, then he's got you, even though maybe you don't understand all the, the inner workings of it, just trust that the power of God is sufficient for all of that. And so we get to chapter 12, that'd be next week, but uh, he's going to turn the page and, and we're going to look at now what is our response to these things. 11 mm-hmm. chapters of salvation about why and how and how much we're saved. And now what is a reasonable response to this information? Yeah. Go in the Lord's peace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>